Good morning, everybody. How you doing? Doing a live session from the home this morning. Today is a teaching day, so we're going to try teaching from the house. Hopefully, you can hear me okay. Chime in. Let me know where you're from, what's going on. But today, really what I wanted to do is talk about all of the previous mini lessons we've done. This is mini lesson 42. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool that it we've gotten to 42. Um, morning. Hope you're doing well. Good afternoon or good evening, wherever you might be. Um, but I wanted to open up this session as opposed to a three or four or five minute mini lesson. I'd like to open this up to a question and answer either about all of the mini lessons we've done to date or maybe potential topics for future mini lessons. So please. Hey, Armando, how are you doing, man? Uh, please share your comments here. Uh, questions, things like that. Um, I'm. This time is for you. And uh, for me, it's so great to do these mini lessons to give back to all the people who support Austin Custom Brass. So again, thank you for anybody who has supported the shop. Really super appreciate uh, the great support you all give us. So please post the questions here. I will um, get to them as quickly as I can. Um, and they can be anything about uh, uh, trumpet, uh, improvisation, technical stuff, entrepreneurship, whatever you might want to talk about. In the meantime, I'm going to have some coffee with my Star Wars mug that my wife got me for Christmas. So, yes, I am a geek. But Gilbert, good morning. Hope you're doing well. Please ask questions that you have. Anybody who's tuning in, uh, let me know where you're tuning in from. So um, splitting notes, that's a good one. Uh, Gruffy, uh, have you ever, uh, are you splitting notes when you're playing in a certain register? Are you splitting notes when you're um, just playing in general? Uh, do you do bends? And that's, you know, like if anybody knows what I do, you know how passionate I am about bends. And what I mean by that is if you're playing certain things like, it just so happens I have a trumpet here, of course. Things like that. Hopefully you guys are doing your Arvins. Arvin book is so wonderful to keep our chops in shape. If you're having some issues with things like this and, and fracking notes, we'll call it, or splitting notes, add bends to anything you play that will really help open up your playing. So like for instance, get that bend in there. Bending the note will help Cape Town. That's cool. Thank you, Nathan. I hope you're doing well. Um, also, there's a great mini lesson. And one of the things that I wanted to do this live session is uh, hopefully if you're asking questions, you've watched some of our mini lessons. If not, there is a playlist. Let me share that playlist with everybody. Let me share that oh, playlist. hey, there I am. So... Uh, I didn't need to hear myself, uh, but either way, uh, <laughs> that's how I sound. Oh, my gosh. You know, that's always the worst part when you record yourself. Hopefully, you guys record yourself every day. And, you know, that's how I sound. Oh, my goodness. But please um, keep the questions coming, and uh, I will get to them in just a second. But I wanted to share the playlist of our mini lessons because there's a, a fair amount of information on those uh, especially when it comes to like tonguing exercises, like the minute drill, things that we've talked about. Uh, the minute drill is super important. Um, if you haven't done it, I can uh, simplify the minute drill in a second. I'm trying to find our playlist, but uh, there we are. Um, again, chime in where you're from, what's going on, things like that. Uh, let me just pop this up and then I'm going to share this with everybody. So if you're tuning in for the first time on our channel, greetings from Germany. That's super cool. Um, good afternoon to you. Um, that is the playlist of our mini lessons. And I think this is number 42. Uh, there was a little bit of a pause while I moved the shop from Boston to Kansas city, but now we're doing mini lessons 
Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, hopefully, um, at 8.30 a.m. Central Time, this time, actually. Uh, so there's, and they're, of course, free. Uh, one thing I really wanted to make sure is that I could give people um, something back because you guys give so much to our shop. Um, so tonguing and articulation. The first thing I'll talk about is the minute drill. And if you don't know the minute drill, you want to know it. It's super easy. It's uh, It was in a letter that Herbert L. Clark, probably arguably one of the greatest brass players who's ever lived, he wrote to a friend talking about how he had issues with uh, playing in terms of articulation. So he just simply took a metronome and started at around quarter note equals 80 or so. I might be uh, not getting that 100% accurate and sped it up very slowly, just doing a 16th notes for a minute. So in other words, if you have to take a breath, you take a breath, but just light 16th notes. I won't take the whole minute because I don't want to waste that time. And really light, almost like it's not even being articulated. It's very, very light. And then you take your metronome. And the great thing with most technical metronome apps these days versus the old click metronome that I used when I was a kid. Yes, I'm old. Uh, older. Uh, is that you could speed it up one click each day until you get to the point where you're maybe breakneck tempoing and where you're holding on for dear love. That's all that's all single tongue. And you work on it until it becomes very light and flexible. Then you could do like quicker bursts where you're going and hitting things, you know, quickly. Um uh hopefully you've all seen that the viral video that went and put of of Ryan Kaiser slurring kind of makes you rethink your priorities as a trumpet player. If you haven't, it's on Winton's uh, Instagram and Facebook page, and it's ridiculous. It's maybe the fastest slurring I've ever seen. Um, Chris Gecker Articulation Studies, they're really great. It's a really great book that has very short exercises. <sighs> Things like... <laughs> Things like that, three bar exercises, really great to work on crispness in your articulation. And as a jazz improviser, you need to work on your articulation in a technical format so that when you improvise, you don't turn like I think it's really, really, really important to do something like that. So, um, and uh, there is a, there are, there is, there are a couple exercises. Uh, in the mini lessons, I talk about articulation um, and things like the speed demons, which are great for jazz improvisations as well. So, so let's. Um, I'm going to jump over here because it's a little easier to read the comments. So, Alan, thanks for tuning in, man. Hope you're still around. Uh, how do you decide whether your hardware is too big? Um, that's a pretty easy answer, to be honest. You know, you got to think about it like shoe size. You know, if, for instance. I wear a 10 and a half, but I thought I wore a 10 and a half. I actually think I wear a 10 now. I think that for some reason we always want to wear bigger things, clothing especially. Um, you know, you want to have the most comfortable fit, the smallest mouthpiece that you can get away with. So depending on what you're doing as a player, um, you might want to reevaluate what's going on in terms of the equipment. For instance, for years when I was in college, I played a 1B. Uh, I thought I wanted a big, rich, huge orchestral sound. And the problem with owning a shop is I play every mouthpiece I make, basically. So there's always a constant state of like newness and or a little bit of a shock therapy when it comes to that. But I will say that right now I've gone full circle back to the first mouthpiece I ever designed, which was my TA1 mouthpiece, which was based off Clark Terry's uh, old Giornelli, but made it a little bit more practical for a modern player like myself. Um and it feels great. It's super comfortable. Uh, I did a long gig, a couple long gigs this weekend, and I had no issues with endurance. Felt good. You know, flexibility was good. That these are the things that you want to really work on. If you've got a large mouthpiece, do the following. And I'm going to step away from the mic a little bit. 
So hopefully the trumpet doesn't sound too distorted. This isn't my good gear for today because the good gear is at the shop and I'm teaching from home. But things like that where you're really working on trying to get a clean articulated shape. And if you if the mouthpiece is too big, I feel like for me personally, now again, this is a personal, a personal preference. I feel like if the mouthpiece is too big, then I'm gonna have a lot of issues with slotting each one of those notes. So I'm gonna get on a recording, especially, especially if I slowed it down to half speed, I'm gonna get different places where my articulated shape is. If you don't record yourself into a, a software that allows you to either slow things down or see the actual wavelengths of your articulation, you're doing yourself a disservice. Anybody who has a Mac out there, record yourself into GarageBand because you can see the wavelengths of your playing. And that is quite enlightening, a little bit scary, um, sometimes frustrating, because you can actually see if your articulated shape is like loop, loop versus really clean. Um, Good morning, Jason. Hope you're doing well. I'll see you next week in a Skype lesson. I'm excited for that, man. Also excited to show you around at the shop. Um, but I don't know if that makes sense, Alan. Um, it's also the same with bore size. I think bore size, Every it's funny. I do so many trade shows, and the first question that most people ask, without a doubt, is what's the bore size on this trumpet? It's like you get an award for having a larger bore size. Um we think maybe the most powerful trumpet player I've ever heard, there's two in my mind, in terms of what I do as a commercial trumpet player, Cat Anderson and Maynard Ferguson. Huge, huge. Have you ever heard Cat Anderson? I mean, like he could play above whatever, but his sound was gigantic. And he played a small bore trumpet and a tiny mouthpiece, tiny mouthpiece. Uh, we actually uh, have... A uh, copy of his mouthpiece in the shop. It's ridiculously small. Maynard Ferguson, his big recordings. Yes, he switched to a larger board later in his career, but his big recordings were on the Constellation Trumpet, which is a small board, 438 board. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, Alan, about things like that, but efficiency for me is more important than size. And I guess that goes hand in hand, but... Um, let me uh, just look at this next comment that just came up. Again, thanks. Post your questions here. If I miss your comments, I, uh, questions and comments, I will get to them as soon as possible. Um, what do you, what do you, of your, uh, okay. I talk a little bit about air in a, in a mini lesson. Um, I'm going to post that right now if I can find it uh, that I think about. Now, again, I want to tell people, um, these are just my thoughts. These are not set in stone. This is not brought down. Moses did not bring this down. But Nathan, check out this video if you haven't. This this video I just posted talks about what I think about in terms of breathing on the trumpet. Uh, not on the trumpet, but uh, breathing as a part of your mechanics of playing. I can, I can briefly summarize here. Um, I'll show you. I'm getting rid of all my air. You can play the trumpet without air. Now, hold on. What? He said no. You, you could play the trumpet without doing something like this. I don't feel comfortable playing without much air inside. Um, Frank Ken, a contemporary of Arbonne, said you could play the cornet. Remember, the cornet was a more popular instrument in the late 1800s than a trumpet. Um, you could play the cornet with just the air inside your lungs. So if you think about a conversational airstream, something that I'm having right now talking to you, I can play with that. with that airstream. You don't have to play tank up. 
a lot of times, a lot of our the problems I see in, in my students is a direct result for them trying to put 27 pounds of pressure into a two pound orifice. In other words, we're taking so much air, we're trying to push it all out, it doesn't work. For me, again, your mileage may vary. That's what this is about. This is not set in stone, but that's my personal feeling. Um, there's another video that we did um, on uh, using using mutes and how mutes can, and the resistance of mutes will help. So, um, oh, I got another question. Well, not here. Equal temper tuning for mouthpieces. No mouthpiece plays in tune. Even if someone says their mouthpieces play in tune, it's a compromise. So, um, for instance, short shank mouthpieces. That's a great idea, right? Short shank um, mouthpieces are awesome, except for they raise the pitch of the partial above the staff. So yeah, so maybe the E and D and fourth line D and, and the fourth space E are better in tune. I'm talking uh, with a shorter shanked mouthpiece and I have a couple here, but um, they also raise the pitch on the G and the A. Everything's a compromise. This is an entire compromise. These are, remember the trumpet is a series of seven natural trumpets in, you know, around one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, there's a compromise in this design. Uh, there are companies, there's a company in France that makes a trumpet that has a really in tune scale with a, a very cool valve block. Um, the ma block helps a little bit. I think certain people like uh, uh, Lotus trumpets have that, um, but anybody can get things with a ma block. I felt like the ma block was too open for myself. So that's why we don't use it in our own line. But uh, let's go back to some other questions here. Eliminating air in the sound at softer dynamics. That's an awesome question. Um, and I think eliminating air in the sound for me, and sometimes I like to put air in the sound actually. You know, you think about like a, a thick, rich ballad. And I don't know, again, this is not a high quality microphone, so you might not hear it, but. <laughs> get that really kind of like I call it the toothless old man sound um, what I would say again another great thing to do I'm gonna go back to bends if you could play soft and bend try to go and find right where for me the center of the buzz happens right here that's where I that's for me Again, everybody's going to be different, but getting rid of that sound. Also, work on your, your poo attacks, poo. And it's not um, not necessarily poo, but it could be P-I-U. Pew, pew, pew. And what you're trying to do is just have the, the, the notes start without a forced articulation, not two or two, like a real forced hard articulation. Um, that will help, I think, a little bit get, at least for me, helps get a little bit of, of, of the uh, smudge or junk in my sound. Uh, I remember watching a video of Hokan playing, and he would do quarter tonal bends against the, like, right against the wall. So, like, if the wall was here, he'd be, like, right against it. Not a full half step, not, not that. It's a quarter tone. I don't know if you can hear that. That quarter tone old Ben, he said that helped get rid of the junk in his sound. And I think bending, again, bending is my favorite thing to do, I think, on the trumpet in terms of when I have a technical limitation or I have something that, that's just not seeming to work right. The bends will help. I uh, hope that makes sense. Again, keep uh, asking questions here. Um, Mondo, could you take about the pressure of the mouthpiece? Um, so you're talking about mouthpiece pressure itself? You know, so there was a, uh, is it Costello? I think, or Roy Stevens talked about putting the horn up. <laughs> to 
So it's literally. Where you're just literally touching the, the horn. It doesn't sound that good. I'm sorry. I don't practice that as much as I should. Um, everybody uses pressure. Anybody who says they don't use pressure is lying. Sorry. But let me back up and say you can try to use as little pressure as possible where you're little. I like to take the horn away from my chops. Where I'm literally like almost having no contact on to the instrument. So that when I play. Like that G right there, I and mean, it's a tiny sound, but it's just working on having the most compact setting and keeping my seal. So a lot of times when we're playing loud, when we're playing loud, it's about the seal of playing versus the actual, you know, nature of pressure. So if you think about, here's the mouthpiece, and this is your chops. You know, most people are pushing the chops into the mouthpiece this way to make the note happen. What have you thought about it just the other way? In other words, here's the mouthpiece. Here are the chops. And the chops are like going, no, man, I don't want to do that. No, man. And the mouthpiece is going, I'm coming. I'm getting closer. This way of playing where you're walking the horn away to, 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 to the point where it actually bends and falls off. Where it literally, it sounds terrible. Sometimes physical things on the trumpet, Caruso would talked about this. Sometimes the physical nature of things on the trumpet will sound awful, but you're not, this is not a musical result we're, we're working on. We're working on making the, the instrument easier. Um, you know? Like literally, it's it's it sounds it sounds awful. You know, if I'm going to practice a, a ballad or if I'm going to practice an etude, I might not use that philosophy. But I'm trying to constantly think about the instrument going away from my face, not towards, not this way, not this way, but this way. I don't know if that makes sense. Hopefully, it does. If it doesn't, um, review that lesson on forward pressure. Um, that's that's also in this mini lesson series, so you can review that and check that out. Uh, that might help. Okay, so double tonguing tongue position. If you try to control that, congratulations. The tongue is involuntary. Um, I try to think about the tongue as the following. Uh, that I'm not trying to control my tongue while talking to you. I'm not trying to control my tongue. That's almost impossible for me. I'm going to let the tongue be natural. The only thing that you're feeling if you're if you have tension and double tonguing, two things. One, how many times have you gone t t t t t t t t t t t t t t t a lot? How many times have you gone kiki 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 kiki? Not many. So practice your k syllable by itself for for a while. I worked at Disney one summer in the All American College Show Marching Band, and. We would do like parades. So every time we did the Mickey Mouse March, I would play everything with a K tongue. Every every note. I just practiced it. Um, and by the end of the summer, I could whip through our, our Etunian, no problem. So um, so one of the things that I want to say is that, you know, that's there's a difference. You know, your, your T syllable is so strong, your K syllable is weak. Work on the K syllable. Maybe I'll do a, a lesson on multiple tonguing. I'm, I don't ever multiple tongue anymore. So it's kind of a, a little bit out of my comfort realm, we'll say. Um, maybe once a year, twice a year, if I have to play a quintet gig or I have to play a solo in front of a concert band, I'll, I'll do it. But uh, something I don't do. I don't know uh, if that made sense, Ali, but uh, let me know. For sure. Again, if you're just tuning in, this is a live session, a live mini lesson that uh, I'm at home and uh, teaching it from home today, trying out some different technology. Hopefully the sound isn't atrocious. Um, we do offer, just to give you a heads up, we do offer Skype lessons 
and Mondays. Oh, Mondays are our Skype day. I'm going to just provide the email. If you email that email address, you can uh, get a hold of one of our guys and one of the guys will set up the time and talk about the rates. It's not crazy expensive, just to give you a heads up. But uh, I also want to thank you all for watching all of these mini lessons, posting suggestions. I'm really into uh, you know taking suggestions in terms of the mini lessons, and hopefully I can elaborate a little bit more. Um, another sip of coffee. Please post some questions right now. Tell me where you're tuning in from. Tell me what's going on in your trumpet. If you have some issues, uh, trumpet, what's going on in your trumpet? Hopefully not too many creatures are hanging out in your trumpet. But uh, I am going to talk, I am going to do a, uh, a mini lesson on basic maintenance that I do on instruments because let me tell you, I see so many sad trumpets that people haven't taken care of uh, and not, and really have neglected. A lot of times people are like, man, my trumpet's not playing well. Oh man, my trumpet's not playing well. Nothing's going on. I open up their tuning slide. I can't see through the lead pipe. Ugh. Not only is that a biohazard, but you want a smooth tube inside your lead pipe to help your playing. So I think one of my mini lessons is going to be about basic, quick maintenance. Thoughts on the Saturn spit key. I like it. Um, uh, I'm a little concerned. I have it on my new horn, Copernicus. I'm using a different horn right now just for fun. But uh, on my main Copernicus horn, I have them. I think it's cool because you can hit them from any angle. I'm a little concerned what's going to happen when one of the rings breaks on a gig. That's the problem, I think, with the Saturn water key. But it's also pretty uh, expedient in terms of how quickly it gets rid of the water. So right now, 50-50. I, I kind of like it and I kind of dislike it. There is no good water key. Ideally, actually, I would prefer to not have any water key on my horn, like the Shilky Fattest model, but I hate taking out my tuning slide or flipping my horn on a performance. I think as a, for someone in the audience, that's kind of disgusting. So, um, you know, shaking out a tuning slide in the middle of your gig. But And cheers to the Star Wars mug. Hope everybody's doing well. Please keep those questions uh, go, coming. Um, let's see. I have to look on it for some reason. I can't see the questions that well. So, um, uh, the key to longevity and endurance, uh, is practicing. <laughs> That's kind of a drag, isn't it? That's such a terrible answer. But, um, one of my teachers, uh, Ben Wright, who plays, uh, I think he's second trumpet in the Boston Symphony Orchestra, uh, amazing trumpet player, incredible teacher. He said he was ready. I remember him last time we were working on Walter Smith Top Tones. Hopefully you guys know the Walter Smith Top Tones book. It's a pain in the butt, 12 major, 12 minor etudes, plus some great preliminary exercises at the beginning of that book. But he said he knew he was ready for his auditions when he could play like the first five of them, like three or four times in a row without missing a note. And I was like, man, that's intense. That's endurance. You build endurance by playing. You think about, you think about, guys who play extended improvised solos, like someone like Peter Evans. If you haven't seen Peter Evans, by the way, I'm going to post, actually, now that I'm talking about it, you want to know what my favorite video on YouTube is? And it could be the narcoleptic dog, but we're talking trumpet right now, right? So I can't, there it is a little bit. This is my favorite video on YouTube. It's maybe, and this is, I, mean, I think Peter Evans is the greatest trumpet player alive. Um, Hold on a second. Watch that video after this. You could, or you leave now, actually. Watch it. That is maybe the finest trumpet playing you'll ever hear. You might not dig the music. That's okay. Um, I think that's also cool because you can have a polarizing opinion on something going on. Uh, but that's my favorite trumpet playing. And that's true endurance. I've seen... Uh, uh, I've seen, and I don't know what, uh, Rusty, no love for Rusty. So sorry, I don't know what that means, man. But uh, 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 what was I gonna say? True endurance is, is worked up. You know, there's no, there's no quick solution. Just like I'm starting to run again, I have plans on running races this summer and I'm not able to run a, next, a long period of time more than I was a month ago, no doubt. But um, the, the big thing 
uh, I, I'm trying to do is increase the endurance and that's just slow. You build it up. So if you can play 30 minutes in your practice session without getting super tired, see what 40 minutes does. Uh, a couple of big things I see a lot of in my students, especially younger students, you don't rest nearly as much and you just play, 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 play. Rest as much as you play, if not twice as much as you play as you're learning. Um, two, take the horn away from your face while practicing. A lot, I had a student in lessons, um, uh, I had a student in lessons this Saturday and they were playing and they were got done playing and they were working on another phrase, but they kept the horn up. Well, anytime you get the horn and it's coming up to the chops, this tenses because it's the, the body is an amazing machine and it's not stupid. Trumpet players, maybe we're a little stupid, but the, this goes, oh no, don't, don't bring that thing up to me. One of the things that you're going to want to work on is making sure that you take the horn away, put it on, put it on your knee, take the horn away occasionally, not to give yourself so much tension when you're playing. But uh, someone asked a question, a couple things. Oh, okay. Hey, Zach, what's happening, man? Sorry. Dust, uh, I like Mishka. Oh, woo -woo. Oh, woo -woo. So anyways, um, I like Mishka for some reason. Um, sorry, that's kind of random. I'm going back that's to another, kind of sorry, I'm going back to another channel here just to see our comments. Cause I'm, I can't see them on what I'm using. Um, no, that's not me. Sorry. Um, okay. Someone said, how do you growl on trumpet? Uh, there's a few different ways to growl on the trumpet. Arr, no, no, I'm just kidding. Um, the one I do mostly is uh, by fluttering. So, so that's one of the things you could also, you can hum while playing. And uh, I don't like doing that. That's too much tension in my, in my body. And I don't like tension. Well, you need tension, but I don't, so I don't want to play in that space, but um, a few other things that you can do as well. So, but that's what I do is I just roll my R's. Uh, and if you can't roll your R's, that means that this is closed. So you're trying to create resistance probably in not the most ideal way. So another thing you can combine is bends and growling. to do try it sometime that's going to show you and i can't really do it either but um i'm working on it uh i do maybe 10 30 seconds a day so it's not super work i don't need to like spend an hour on it every day but i'm trying to eliminate tension it's all about eliminating the tension in your body i think and then when you actually do need tension for certain things like you're playing a triple high c like zach can um then you can put it in so uh, again, if you're just tuning in, thanks for tuning into this uh, live mini lesson. Uh, we won't do this too, too often, but uh, we are now at 42 lessons. And um, thanks to everybody who's watched these. And uh, thank you for your awesome support of ACB. Super appreciate it. Today, I'm teaching from home. So that's why it's a little bit lower fidelity, lower quality here. Sorry. Um, but you get to see the great wallpaper we have at the um uh, well, okay, that's that's who is the greatest trumpet player again. My favorite trumpet player on the scene right now is a guy named Peter Evans. He's a amazing trumpet player, very avant garde, and most people will hate what he plays, but I think he's maybe the finest trumpet player alive. Really scary. So, um, okay, let me see some other questions here. Mike, hey, Mike, how are you, man? Uh, some insights you gained from Clark Terry. Well, you are not the first person to ask that question. So I'm going to talk about that in a mini lesson. Maybe uh, I've already recorded it. I've just got to edit edit it down a little bit because it's super long uh, for our mini lesson series. Normally, our mini lessons are between two and a half to five minutes, and I want to keep them short. So um, I might do another one, but uh, I think that will probably launch next Monday, to be honest. So stay tuned. We have a few in the we have a few uh, lessons in the in the can. We'll say uh, about it. But a 
couple of things I learned about Clark Terry or learned from Clark Terry are way more than musical lessons I can talk um, uh, talk about. Uh, first and foremost, um, he's the nicest man I ever met and would give you the shirt off his back. Uh, he's just so warm and kind. Uh, you know, in, in a day where like where he, especially with all the stuff that happened to him in his life, he didn't have to be kind to me, especially, but he was more than kind. Just, just, just an incredible giving man. Um, two, every performance he played was like his last performance he would give. In other words, I think a lot of us as musicians take for granted the fact that we're on a performance stage and it's, and we'll be back tomorrow. But he always played. And I remember seeing him a couple of times and playing with him a couple of times where he went to the hospital that night because he was so sick. Um, a couple uh, times in the early 90s when I first started playing with him, he was quite ill for some time. And you would never know it if you were in the audience. You, he always gave his A game. And there are a lot of musicians like that that I've seen. You know, um, A modern equivalent of that nowadays, I think, is someone like Arturo, who always gives his finest performance every time, uh, which is very inspiring. Just we take that for granted that, oh, tomorrow I'm going to play. But what if tomorrow doesn't come? You know, make sure that you play like two things. Make sure that you play and you think like maybe uh, the most important person in the world is, you know, listening in your audience. Maybe somebody who has a record contract, which don't exist anymore, or someone who's going to, you know, uh, give you a give you a, a tasty gig. Or maybe there's someone you know, like I played, my wife was in the audience on Saturday, so I played for her, especially. So, um, all right. Oh, that's a good, Zach asked a great question here. Sorry. Um, what's the biggest misconception you see when people come, they want big. That's the biggest misconception. Um, people want a quick fix. There are no quick fixes. Sorry. I, if there was a quick fix, I would have figured it out. Um, and Zach, very, very nice comment. Thank you so much. Um, one thing I will tell you, cause I'm on this, I'm in terms of trumpet playing, I'm happy where I am as a trumpet player, even though I'm working to be a better, but in terms of a person and especially my health, I'm working on it quite hard these days. And I will just say one thing, um, with the health, it didn't take me six months to get big. And I was quite big about six months ago. Um, I figure if it takes me 10 years to get back to a normal weight, I will, I'll work that time. So if, if you took that same attitude with trumpet playing, I think it would really help. Um, so a lot of people come into my shop. I want a mouthpiece for higher notes. I remember I had a, a young student many years ago and I, like I said earlier in this uh, lesson that I play every mouthpiece I make and I test them. So I, I picked up the biggest mouthpiece I make, which was an FX mouthpiece. And actually I can do this right now. Uh, we open up the mouthpiece pouch and everybody should, oh, it was already open. Oops. Um, everybody should have a mouthpiece pouch full of uh, broken broken promises. That's the mouthpiece pouch of broken promises. They, they promised me I'd be able to play this. So let me show you. Um, what I mean. So this is my FX mouthpiece. This is deeper than my actual deepest flugelhorn mouthpiece. And so the kid came in and he was like, I want a mouthpiece for high notes. And I was like, oh, that's great. Um, played a little bit and it was very clear that he needed to work on his fundamentals. So I did something that I have only done, I think a few times in my life in the shop. And I said, hey man, why not spend your money taking a lesson with me and I can show you some stuff to practice to greatly improve your playing versus getting a mouthpiece? Well, he was not happy by that. He was quite pissed. So I did the following demonstration. I grabbed my FX mouthpiece and played a G about high C, just like that. And then I grabbed a whole bunch of other mouthpieces and kept playing a G, you know? I mean, this is a deep mouthpiece, folks. That's a deep mouthpiece. That is huge. Huge. So, and I played it. So, 
I'm not, and that's, I, it, it was probably not the best thing to do. It was a little bit of a trumpet egotistical thing to do. But my point being is the mouthpiece does not make the note. Mark Curry, great mouthpiece maker out in Reno says, no mouthpiece has ever missed a note by itself. And that honestly is true. So I don't know if that um, makes any sense, uh, but that's the biggest thing I see in the shop is that people are over uh, obsessed about bore size and also, you know, they want a quick fix. There, there are no quick fixes. I'm, I'm preaching now because my health, there's no quick fix. And, you know, if you fall off the rails one day or two days, th that's no problem. You miss practice for a couple of days, that's okay. But you can actually, you know, switch back and get right back to your fundamentals, you know? The trumpet doesn't play itself. Oh man, I wish, I wish, I wish. So, um, but uh, Barbara, she asked a question, increase range. Well, um, I have a few things on that. You should check out um, one of the, the drills that I like is the marksmanship drill. You might want to check that, that out. Marksmanship drill is really wonderful to help solidify some of your range it's in one of the mini actually it might not be in one of the mini lessons so but i think i might have added added it to the mini lesson playlist if not i will go after this session and post it there anyways uh you're tuning into a live session of a live a live session of mini lessons um again thanks so much for your super support of acb thanks uh for watching these lessons um Okay, uh, welcome Luke. And uh, and uh, if you have specific questions about any of the lessons that are up there so far online, you scroll up these comments, you'll find uh, the link to the mini lessons. Please post them. Um, and I will have another sip out of my Star Wars mug. Normally the lightsabers light up when it's hot, so the coffee is not so hot anymore, but. Uh, truly enthralling, I know. A few more minutes uh, before I have to start getting ready for my day of teaching. Uh, I teach on Mondays, uh, Skype lessons and correspondence lessons. If you can't do Skype lessons, um, you can uh, sign up for correspondence lessons where you send me videos in. I analyze your videos. I write out exercises and uh, send back with a with a follow-up video. So say you have a very, 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 very busy schedule. You can't squeeze an hour out for a Skype lesson. We can do it that way. All you have to do is email the shop info at austincustombrass.com and uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, anybody have, uh, in the last few minutes, some suggestions for future mini lessons? I've got a few here. I'm going to review all of the comments from this live session and work on uh, some upcoming lessons. I have already lessons in the um, in the cloud, we'll say, that we are going to launch Wednesday and Friday. And we do uh, do live uh, – no, not live, sorry. We do um, – launch our mini lessons Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 8.30 a.m. Central Standard Time. So if you have any, post them here, post them on our Facebook page. Check out our Facebook page if you haven't. Um, there's lots of goodies there. Uh, we also have an Instagram page um, doing a little bit endurance for old trumpet players. Well, there's some things we talked about endurance here. Uh, I'm an old trumpet player, so I, I guess I guess we're all in the same boat. Uh you know what? It's funny. I remember Clark uh, doing a performance with Doc Cheatham and Clark, um, Clark said, when I grow up, I want to be Doc Cheatham. And now Clark was maybe 80 at the time and Doc was in his late 80s or early 90s. I don't know how far they were separated uh, in age, but I think it was around 10 years. So when Clark said that, I just broke up laughing because I was like, man, that's a good attitude to have. When I grow up, I'm going to, you know, but Clark's, you know, 75 or 76 at the time. So hip bebop patterns to shed, transcribe. Um, <laughs> you want to learn something that's hip? Um, uh, easiest thing to do is transcribe. Um, I have, a, Mike, it's funny, Mike, you're asking all these questions that are superb. I have a mini lesson in the can for Friday about uh, doubling on other instruments. So that's going to be one of our uh, upcoming mini lessons. So you should check that out on Friday. Uh, and I do 
I do actually flugelhorn, cornet, and piccolo trumpet and talk about the the, the things. Because lately I've been playing a lot of cornet and I'm, I'm really digging cornet. I never was into cornet, so now I'm back into it. So, I don't know. Fickle trumpet player. Shocker. Um, what do you think about the Taylor trumpet? I think it's cool. I'm just checking it out right now. Um, trying to decide that it, uh, if... ACB wants to carry Taylor trumpets. I think Andy makes amazing instruments. I'm just trying to see the, the feasibility of it on a financial standpoint. But, uh, uh-oh, trumpet bore size. Trumpet bore size. How to choose the best bore size? Well, okay, that's a better question. But um, what's, what size shoe do you wear? Trumpet bore size like shoe size. We talked about this earlier, actually. Um... If a, if a bore size is too big, you're going to have real issues playing in tune. That's the first thing I see in my uh, working with, with customers. If the bore size is too big, you're going to have real problems playing in tune. Also, you're going to have probably big problems uh, articulating cleanly in the lower register. Maybe it's nice in the upper register when you're using lots of air and forcing the note to happen, but primarily um, that's going to be the offset. Now a bore size that's too small might actually constrict you in the upper register. Not always the case uh, because we, we just mentioned Cat Anderson and uh, Maynard who both play small bore instruments. Um, I think it's all about the balance of your airstream in relationship to the trumpet. Um, I play the following. Uh, okay. So my Copernicus is a polybore instrument, but primarily a medium large. Uh, my long cornet that I play a lot is a 438 bore and my con uh, copper 9A cornet which is also one of my primary horns is a 485 bore so I play a bunch of different bores but each one of the mouthpieces is very specific for that particular instrument and I can't just play each uh, mouthpiece and have that work for that I don't know if that makes sense but um so I think a lot of it is really making sure you – where do you want your resistance? Let's talk about that a little bit. You know, I feel like there's – you when you're playing into an instrument, um, uh, where do you want your resistance? You want it further into the horn? Do you want it right up at the, at the front of the lead pipe? So, um, yeah, but a medium-large doesn't mean anything. Sorry, Barbara. A medium-large bore with a bad design and a tight compressed lead pipe and – uh, braces that are have too much tension put on them and a bell that's out of kilter. Maybe the, the bell bead is not rounded. All these things, they can make a medium large bore trumpet play smaller than a small bore trumpet. Um, everything affects everything. That's the terrible way of saying it, folks, but it's true. Bore size is overrated. I'm just going to say it. Bore size is overrated. You make a gigantic uh, bore size trumpet and you combine it with an old Besson. That's like, think about the Besson Miha, which is a 470 bore trumpet, but it had a uh, Venturi mostly, and I, I, we've only measured maybe 10 or 20 of them in the shop. Venturi of 337 to 342 and some as small as 335. And the Venturi is the opening of your lead pipe after the gap. Um, well, that, that now changes everything. You take a uh, Yamaha Bergeron trumpet, fantastic trumpet. Um, that Most of the Venturis I've measured on that horn are 351. Well, that's a gigantic number right at the lead pipe. I had a Monet, which was 357. So um, it's that's not the bore size. But in my opinion, that might be more important than the bore size of the trumpet. Uh, sorry to get a little preachy there, but... Um, another great aspect of the Constellation, had a big bell, had a wide wrap, had stress-free bracing on it, so that, you know, all contributed to the op openness of the horn. Now, another thing that people don't understand is that there's a balance between player and instrument. So when people pick up the, if I asked someone, if I gave them and they had no, um, experience with instruments and I gave them a small bore horn and a large bore horn, more often than not, they'll play the small bore horn and go, oh man, that's that's what I want. That's really open. Because the body perceives resistance almost exactly opposite of what we actually do. In other words, if somebody's saying to me, hey man, can you make this back bore 
more open because I want I want my my I want my playing more open. I actually can make them a tighter back where and they go, oh, that's exactly what I want. Don't know if that makes much sense, but it's the balance perceived resistance. Maybe that's a good topic for a, a, an upcoming um, mini lesson as well. Perceived resistance. Uh, how do you know when a horn's too tight? Well, that's an entire different thing. I can't spend another hour and a half talking about that. But uh, that also is something that we'll probably hit in this upcoming lesson. Um, just wanted to say thank you all who have tuned in. It's been fun. Hopefully it wasn't too bad audio quality. And um, we um, truly, again, thank you so much for your great support you bring to the shop. If you have any future uh, suggestions for a mini lesson, post them here. Uh, and also, uh, thanks again. Come hang out at the shop. Oh, anybody in the Kansas City area, March 18th, we're having a, an open house. Uh, Mila Adams from Adams Brass will be at the shop on March 18th. It's a Monday, and I've hired a, an amazing rhythm section to play, and we're going to have a jam session and concert at the end of the day. Food, free, fun. It's just a, what we do uh, annual Adams Day. So please, if you're, if you're able to come to Kansas City, um, we'll pick you up from the airport. Come and hang out at the shop on March 18th. We've got a few fun things to play. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to do a little bit of practicing before my first lesson. Thanks, everybody. You guys have an awesome day. Talk to you soon, okay? Ciao for now.